All right, Joey's here. We can get started. Um, so all right, we're, today we're going to talk about uh, more logging and recovery stuff for you know for a database system. Uh, but we're sort of differentiate between what we're talking about today between last class. So last class was all about the the physical logging, and now we're talking about alternative methods that aren't as common. Um, so, so before we get to that, though, I want to spend some time doing some course announcements for the project and some other things that are going up. Uh, and then I want to spend some uh, little time at the beginning to clarify some of the questions that Matt and Adam had about physical logging that they didn't quite know the answer. Um, and we can we just clarify the, the, those, those issues. And then we'll spend time on the paper that you guys are assigned to read, this command logging stuff um, that's in VoltDB. And then we'll talk about different methods of doing MRE checkpoints. And then we'll finish off talking about a neat little trick in a paper that Facebook wrote about a year or two ago of how to do fast restarts of an in-memory database system using shared memory. OK, so the first major announcement is that Project 2 will have an automatic extension for everyone. So it's no longer due this Wednesday. It is due a week from now during spring break on March 9th at, uh, at midnight. So this is automatic for everyone. Uh, and so what this means, because we're giving you an extra week in time to work on this, we expect the implementation to be uh, very good. So it means we want to see a lot of test cases. We want to see that your thing can perform well and scale and uh, you know, achieve better performance than you, maybe the, than you would have if you submitted it two days from now. OK? So now, just because Project 2 has been extended by a week, that doesn't mean that everything else has been bumped up. So that means that on, after we come back from spring break on that first Monday, every group is going to have to do their project proposals here in class. So that's still going to be due on March 14th. And I'll explain on Wednesday. Wednesday, we'll spend time talking about different topics you can work on in your project. We'll talk about what I expect in a proposal. Um, and then going forward after spring break, we'll spend time talking about how to do, you know, develop in, in a large database system, like you know, so kind of how to work on legacy code. I'm also going to, uh, because now uh, we're going to spend Wednesday this week talking about the project proposals, we were going to talk about compression. We're going to talk about that after spring break. So there's going to be no assigned reading for this Wednesday. Uh, everything has just been slot, you know, uh, slid off by, or slid down the schedule by one. And then we're going to drop one of the lectures on hybrid systems. There was two, two days allotted for it. Uh, we're just going to drop one of them. So everything's sort of just been shifted down. So any questions about this? Okay, also because now we're giving you more time to do project two, and we expect that the code will be, your implementation will be uh, better, I'm also sh sh shuffling around the uh, grade breakdown. So it used to be project two was worth 20% of your grade, and the final exam was 10%. So now is, I've, I've moved, or I've, or sorry, the final exam was 15%. So I've moved five percent percentage points out of the final exam and put it into your project two. Right, so basically, because the final exam is going to be based on the reading review, so combined together, you get 20% there. So we're giving you more time to work on Project 2, but we're making it count more for your final grade. Okay? Any questions about this? Who here has a working Project 2 BW2 implementation so far? Raise your hand. I know somebody submitted it, right? And they, they passed everything but the, what the, the, the memory leak check. All right? What's that? Those you guys? Ish. It, work, it works sort of. Okay. All right. So again, like uh, both Joy and myself will be around spring break next week. Uh, so if you know if you want to talk to us or talk to him or meet us, meet up with us, just shoot us an email. Okay. All right. So the other two things I want to again the clarifications for the questions we had last week. So Adam had a question or Alex had a question about uh, could you use logical logging. Uh, would logical logging still work with snapshot isolation? And then Matt had a question about the way the silo R did the persistent epoch stuff. So I want to go through both of these and, and sort of clear things up. So the example we had before about why logical logging uh, wouldn't work, the example I originally showed were running these two transactions, with each with one query, running on a lower isolation level like read committed. And so the, if we run this under snapshot isolation, well, what would happen is this first guy starts running, and we would app append the exact query we were, we were running in our logical log. 
And then the cursor would start moving through the, the, the tuples and updating them one by one. So it would get to this first one, update it, get to the second one, update it. But then now before it could get to this third tuple, we have a context switch. And now the other query starts running. And of course, we have to append it to our logical log. It gets in and modifies this tuple, sets it, uh, Joy's salary to $900, and then commits. And then when we go back and try to now continue running our query, when we would get to this, we would see that it's been modified in the future from when we started. Uh, and therefore, this transaction could not complete. It would have to abort, roll back any of its changes. And so what I didn't really talk about, but we would have to do in this particular example is we'd have to be able to remove this entry from the log. So that means that because the transaction hasn't committed yet, we would just keep this in memory. And then when we realize it aborts, we just blow it away. And never, nothing ever gets written out the disk. So now, the, if you were doing this on the snap side of isolation, my intuition is that I think that logical logging would still work if the log entries included information about the order in which they finished. So what we sort of, if we are pending it as it, as, it, as the queries first arrive and then as they get executed, if we append it in that order, then the execution order might actually differ uh, based on how things get scheduled. So what we would have to include in our logical log to say, like, this guy came before, for, before this guy. And therefore, we could try to infer from that uh, in what order we should be able to get to these things. So snapshot would, would would help us with this. If we had to run other queries with lower isolation levels in a mixed environment, which happens all the time, Right, running analytical queries or running things that aren't as important, you can run, uh, run and you know again lower isolation levels. Then this simply wouldn't work at all because we'd still have this anomaly where if we reran the queries on recovery, we could end up with a different state of the database. So I, the main takeaway of this is I think snapshot isolation could work. Uh, I kind of thought over the weekend of a bunch of different examples of where you know where you could have a problem, um, but it only works if you can capture their uh, commit order in the log and not just their execution order. Okay. So now the Adam or Matt's question about silo R had to deal with about this persistent epoch file. So remember that we have our architecture sort of looks like this. We have our different storage devices, uh, and they each have a logger thread, and then those logger threads have a series of uh, worker threads that are making changes to the database and appending. Uh, entries, log records to this guy's buffers, and then he eventually flushes them out the disk. And so what happens is we have one logger thread that's designated as the special persistent epoch thread, and it's responsible for writing out this persistent epoch file to disk. So what happens is when the epoch thread says we have a new epoch, all these guys start uh, flushing out everything, everything that corresponds to that epoch to their, to their storage device. And then when they do that, when that fsync completes, then they notify the persistent epoch thread that they've successfully stored the information at this epoch. And once it gets the acknowledgments from all the different uh, threads, the logger threads, it's then able to append this to the persistent epoch thread. So Matt's question was, is this thing even necessary? Because all the logger threads will know that they've flushed out the epoch up to this point. Um, and so on recovery, all you have to do is just check to see whether everybody has successfully committed 200. And then if so, you know that that would be equivalent to what was in here. And the reason why you have to wait till everybody commits to, uh, com is able to flush their epoch up to, up to the point is because you may have a transaction that made modifications that span multiple uh, worker threads. So they each are, uh, then you're each writing out two separate uh, logger threads. So I actually emailed Eddie uh, this weekend and asked him about whether this is even necessary. Um, and he responded 15 minutes ago. So I'll do the best I can to summarize what he said. So he basically says that Matt's absolutely right, that you don't need this at all um, because everything you needed to know what, what was the last persistent epoch you can get from uh, the lo individual log files. And so he makes the point that uh, Avoiding this additional f-sync allows you to improve the latency by roughly 20 milliseconds, right? Because you're not waiting for these guys f-sync and then this guy to f-sync. Um, but he fully admits that, like, going from you know, on average, they're doing about 90 seconds, 90 milliseconds per, 90 millisecond latency per transaction on average, and 
uh, removing this only gets you down to seven, 70 milliseconds, which is still not that very good. Um, the main reason that I took from his email about why they do, why they have this, is that it makes the, the implementation of the recovery protocol a lot easier because you don't need to do anything special scans in these log files to figure out what the last persistent epoch actually is. You just look and look at one location and you can then use that to go through and, and, and replay the logs as needed. So it's not for anything special. It's only, they only did this because it makes it easier to do software engineering. And then their argument was they're already running at 90, you know, 70 milliseconds for latency, which is not that good in a transaction processing system. So adding another 20 milliseconds to add this log file that makes it easier to do recovery was a trade-off they were willing to make. So Matt's intuition was absolutely right, where you don't need this persistent, persistent epoch. They only, do to, they only use it to make implementation easier. OK? And I'll, I'll, I'll forward you the email from, from Eddie. OK. So, all right, so now let's get to the new stuff. So remember that last class, we made a distinction between physical logging schemes and logical logging schemes. And we said that the physical logging scheme is where you're actually storing the low-level information about what was modified in the database on a per-query basis. Right, so you can actually say, you know, this offset for this tuple, here's the, here's the new value that I, I, I install for these different attributes. And remember we said that in in-memory database, we don't need to store any undo information because as soon as the transaction commits, we blow away all the in-memory log, in-memory information, in-memory undo information uh, for that transaction and don't need to write it out to disk because we never are going to have to reverse its changes. So for physical logging, it's going to be slower for execution. Like it's going to make the runtime system go slow, slower because we're having to prepare and copy all this information that we want to write to our log buffers. But it's going to make phys uh, our logging, our recovery protocol much faster because we don't have to re-execute any queries. We just take whatever the, the bits that we have uh, for our different attributes in each record, and we supply them into our database. And then we distinguish this between logical logging, where we were storing the high-level information about what either queries or transactions were actually doing, uh, but not what changes they make to the database itself. And we said that this is faster for execution at runtime because it's, it's the amount of information you have to store in the log is much less than physical logging. Uh, but it's going to be slower for recovery because you essentially have to replay and re-execute all the queries and transactions. So the, given this distinction, the paper you guys read about command logging makes the observation that failure in an OLTP database system is actually kind of rare. Um, because OLTP databases aren't that big. They're usually measured in the orders of maybe hundreds of gigabytes. And the largest one that I know about is 10 terabytes. So they're not that big. And therefore, they're not running on hundreds of machines. So we're not talking about like a Hadoop cluster at Google or Yahoo or whatever, where they're running on 5,000 machines. And then in that case, yes, those, those machines, you know, at, at any given time, one of them is always going to be you know, down or, fa or fail. Most OLTP databases run on 10 machines. Many run on a lot less. So in that case, the likelihood that your hardware is going to fail is not that high. So therefore, it's better to optimize your database system to assume the comma case that you're not going to crash. And therefore, you want to get the, the best performance you can get for the, all your runtime operations, your execution of queries and transactions. And then if you ever crash, then yes, it'll be a little bit slower, but that's a rare case. And, 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 uh, and you just deal with it when it happens. And we'll talk about how replication fits into this as well. Um, that allows you to even avoid the recovery protocol in its entirety. So the logical logging scheme that you guys read about in the paper was, is called command logging. Um, and the basic idea of command logging is that you're, you're going to store the invocation of a store procedure that the client makes on, uh, to, the, to the database system. So remember we talked about store procedures are like these uh, RPC calls or RPC mechanisms where you can declare a function that has a bunch of program logic that's intermixed with SQL statements. And so the, the client or the application says, I want to execute that function. Here's the input parameters. And then that gets invoked as a transaction by the worker thread. So in command logging, the only thing we need to store is the name of the store procedure that we executed, the input parameters that we provided to the function itself, and then there'll be some additional safety checks that we want to log to make sure that 
uh, when we have to recover from the log that we re-execute exactly the same store procedure that we had before. So for example, you could store like a checksum or a version ID and say that you know, it's store procedure foo, and here's the version that I executed it before. And that way, someone comes along and changes foo uh, to either change the SQL statements or to change the actual program logic itself. You don't re-execute it and get a different result again. So you're guaranteed that whatever is executed the first time, you execute the second time. So essentially, you can think of command logging as just transaction logging for store procedures. That's all it is. We don't store the individual SQL statements that, that it executes. We just store that, again, that one single store procedure invocation. So one aspect of how, why command logging can work is something that we haven't really talked about yet. Um, and that's this idea of a deterministic concurrent control scheme. So the idea of a deterministic concurrent control scheme is that if I have the same state of the database uh, that I had before, and I execute the same store procedure with the same input parameters, then I'm guaranteed to get the exact same new state of the database that I had the first time I, I tried this. So if I have, if I ran the database system first and I execute some, some query that, or transaction that updated the database, uh, if I crash, come back, and I get back to that same state and execute that same transaction again, I'll get the same new state of the database. So this relies on, on two things. The first is that we have to have the order of our transactions, uh, assuming we're doing command logging, we have to have their order that predefined before they start executing. So it's not like in like MVCC where you let things start whenever they want and then you just you know, interweave, interleave the operations as they come along. We have to know exactly before we start running what the order is going to be. And the second thing is that we have to require that our transaction log logic or the program logic in the store procedure itself has to be deterministic. So what I mean by that is, let's say we have a database that has one value, A equals 100. And so we have three transactions here, then we come up with the, we, we satisfy the first condition, we're going to order them ahead of time. And now if you look at the logic for each of these transactions, it's all deterministic. So A equals A plus 1, A equals A, A, A times 3, and A equals A minus 5. So that means that no matter how many times I execute these guys over and over and over again for this database state, it's always going to come out with the same result, right? Because these are obviously deterministic. An example of a non-deterministic uh, transaction would be something like this. A equals A times what the current time. So that means if I run this today and I run this tomorrow, this now function is going to return, always return back a different result. So that means that I'll get a different value if for my database state here. So this is an example of a non-deterministic program logic in a transaction. Is this clear? So this is why, so, so in VoltDB's command logging, they're going to disallow stuff like this. Because if I ran this today and my database crashes tomorrow and I rerun this, I'm going to get back a different value and end up with an uh, inconsistent database state. And therefore, I'm not, not going to be able to recreate the, you know, exactly how I was before. So this is bad. We don't want to do this. So I want to spend now a little bit of time talking about the architecture. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so when you say the part of the transaction is defined before they start executing, uh, is that part of the transaction that want to process? You don't really need to know that if you want to Just like before starting, you need to know that now I'm starting to, right? So your question is, if, if I have three transactions, I order them one, two, three. Or, or, or you can order one, three, two, but yes. before starting three, you should know that you are doing three. It's not like, it's not a predefined order, right? Um, you can do scheduling. It should be a deterministic order, but you can do scheduling. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, so, so like, say that, say that on my node, one arrives first, three arrives second, and two arrives third. I could flip the order of these yeah. based on the yes. That's fine. But you have, you have to like have to be sure that it's in that order. Yes, correct. Yes. All right. Um, so I want to spend some time now describing actually the Vol the Volt DB architecture. And I guess full disclosure, I wrote a system when I was in grad school. I, I with some people, we built a system called called HStore, and then they took HStore, forked our code, and made Volt DB. So the high level architecture that I'm describing is the same thing that we developed in HStore. That's now in the commercial product Volt DB. Um, I don't want to say full disclosure because, like, I, so I'm biased in some ways about the, the design of the system. 
uh, but I'll be totally upfront about where I think the uh, deficiencies are. So, and we've, we've already sort of talked about the h -Door concurrent scope protocol, uh, so now I want to talk about, you know, what the actual physical architecture of the system looks like. So, assuming now we're running on a single node, uh, our database is going to be split up into these disjoint subsets called partitions uh, that are stored entirely in main memory. And then for each partition, we're going to assign them a single threaded execution engine on a single core that has exclusive access to all the data at this partition, right? Uh, and so you can think of this, you know, in our earlier work, we didn't really worry about NUMA regions, but you can imagine like this is a sort of one core running on one NUMA region, and there's another core running on another NUMA region. So they can all access uh, memory that's local to them. So now the client will send a request, and again, we said we're, we're primarily running with a stored procedure API, so we're going to pass in the name of the procedure that we want, and then its input parameters. And so in VaultDB, all the stored procedures are essentially, think, think of them as like Java class files, uh, and they're going to have two parts. The first part is at the top, you're going to have these pre-declared uh, queries that the stored procedure is going to invoke. And these are essentially the same thing as prepared statements because where there are, you could have constants, you could put in these question marks that say that there's some, there's going to be a value that's going to be inserted for this argument here in the query, and I'll give that to you at runtime. But the database system can do all the query planning and optimization ahead of time, uh, even though it doesn't know what the value is for these guys. And then all of these queries are going to have a, a unique name within the context of the store procedure. And then we have a run method. And the run method takes in these input parameters, and these are the same parameters that the client's going to send us over the wire as part of the request. And then within the store procedure logic itself, it's intermixed with you know, regular Java code, but then it makes calls to invoke the predefined queries that we have up above, and of course we pass in more input parameters that then are substituted for the question marks there. So the, the, the way a store procedure written like this, has to, the, the requirement that it has to be deterministic means that just as before in the example I showed where you couldn't have the anything that based on the current time or the date, you can't have anything like that inside of the, the function here. You can't make a call to a random number generator, uh, and you also can't make a call to an outside system. So you can't make an RPC request to some other remote system, get back a value, then have an if branch that says if the return value is this, execute this query, or if it's that, execute that query, right? Because again, if we come back and run this another time, that, that, that external service may provide us with a different answer. We would not get back the same, the same result and end up with the incorrect database state. So in the early days, I went on, I guess we could call it a sales call with Stonebreaker and some other people in like the early days of VaultDB. We went to go visit PayPal. And PayPal's transactions, like sort of in, uh, when you would send money from one person to another, in the middle of the transaction, they would make a call out to an outside fraud detection system uh, that would turn back, come back with a result, and based on that result, it would say, you know, should this transaction commit or not? Uh, so that wouldn't work in, 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 in this kind of uh, environment because let's say the database crashes uh, and you come back online and you start replaying all your transactions that are making calls to the fraud detection system, but now that fraud detection system is down and therefore, if this external service now is causing our database to never be able to recover because we're not going to be able to, re, you know, invoke that RPC request again. So by decoupling in, uh, the two different services, you avoid that problem, but then you can't use uh, a, a system like VoltDB for, for PayPal's workload. Okay, so we get, we get a request, the transaction gets a timestamp, and then it gets queued up at whatever partition that has the, the, the data that it needs to access. Before the transaction starts running, though, we're going to write out its entry to the command log all right, on disk. And then we have to do a group commit and we'll flush. And once we know that it's durable on disk to the command log, then our transactions will be allowed to start running. And so for this, what we're going to store in a command log is the, the same procedure name and input parameters that the client sent us. But we're also going to store its transaction ID because that corresponds to its serial order. Uh, the, the, the order and way it should get invoked. And that way, if we have to recover from the log, we know what order we should replay these, 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 uh, these transactions. So once we know this is durable, then our transaction gets queued and allowed to start running. At some point, it'll, uh, make its you know, it'll execute the queries and make changes to the database. And then when it finishes, we can do a, a commit right away and send a result back to the application. Now, while this is all going on, in addition to, to do command logging, 
uh, there'll be background threads that are going to be taking asynchronous copy and write snapshots of the database or checkpoints of the database and writing them out the disk as well. So now if there's a crash, we do the same thing we did in under physical logging where we load in the last checkpoint that we took and then replay the command log for all the transactions that got up to the point where before we crashed. Okay? So I want to go through now the, the recovery protocol and the checkpointing protocol in a bit more detail. And we'll talk a little bit how command logging actually makes it really easy to do replicated nodes as well, much easier than I think with physical logging. So the logging protocol is that, again, we, we log the same command that the client sent us before the transaction starts running. And so that means that, it, that regardless of whether the transaction commits or not, we always have to log it. So if we have a transaction that aborts, we still have to log it because it, it's, we're doing it before it starts running and we don't know whether it's going to abort later on. So the, most of your transactions in VaultDB, you want them to only touch a single partition, but if they have to touch multiple partitions or multiple nodes, then you don't want the log record for that transaction to appear in different locations because you're not going to know where it, where it actually ran when you recovered the database system or recovered the database. So the base partition is, is, is the idea of where the transaction store procedures are actually going to run. And so that's the place where it's responsible for actually storing the log record on, on its local command log on disk. And so remote partitions don't have to log anything, or remote nodes don't have to log anything for the transaction. But if we have replicas, then the they have to maintain the same log that the master does. Because right? that way, if, if the master dies, the, the slave has an exact copy of, of the, the log and the state of the database as the master. For checkpoints, the way we're going to do this is that, unlike on silo, where they took fuzzy checkpoints, where the checkpoint itself could be inconsistent, in VaultDB, the checkpoints are consistent, uh, meaning that they have an exact, uh, they have a correct snapshot of the database when it's get written, written out the disk. And the way they do this is that they invoke a special transaction that gets queued up uh, like any other transaction in the system. But this transaction is going to lock all the partitions and then invoke or tell them to switch into the checkpoint mode. Right? So because we're running these single threaded engines, when we invoke this special transaction, that blocks any other transaction from running at the same time. Then we sw switch into checkpoint mode. We release the transaction, release the locks. And now a separate thread in the background starts taking our, our checkpoint while we still continue to execute other transactions. And the way we can avoid the inconsistent snapshot is that we switch the database into what's a copy on write mode, a copy on update mode, where instead of doing in-place updates uh, that you normally do, where you just overwrite the current, look, current value of every tuple directly where it exists in memory, anytime you do a, uh, a delete or update, you make a copy of that tuple and you uh, flip a little bit in the header that says that this tuple was modified, inserted, or deleted after the checkpoint already started. So as now our, uh, as our checkpoint thread scans through the table, if it sees any, any tuple with any of these three bits set in its header, it knows it didn't exist when the checkpoint started, and therefore it completely ignores them. Right? And if it finds older stuff, it can, it can clean them up as it goes along. Once it's done scanning all the tuples, then it invokes another transaction that says, all right, we're done doing the checkpoint. We switch out of the copy on update mode. Uh, and now, and we add an entry to our, 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 our command log that says we just completed a successful checkpoint. Here's the location of where it is on disk. Um, and then on recovery, we don't have to do anything. We don't have to modify or look in the log to see how to rectify the snapshot. We know it's, it's fully consistent. All right, so this is the distinction between Silo. Silo did uh, fuzzy checkpoints. VaultDB does non-fuzzy checkpoints. I would say, again, this is, most database systems do fuzzy checkpoints. Uh, this is rare, and they can only do this because they're doing logical logging and the single thread execution engines. All right, so again, we talked about how to do recovery. You just load in the last checkpoint you took from disk, um, and then you have to re-execute all of the transactions in your command log that occurred since after the, the, the checkpoint was created, or at least the checkpoint was started. Uh, so this is, again, different from silo. Silo would go at the newest entry and go back in time, right? And they can do this trick where they know that if something has been modified uh, in the future, then it can ignore the modifications that it finds as it goes back in time that, that are older. In the case of VaultDB, they have to start from the oldest point of the oldest log entry and, and move forward in time, 
right? Because they don't know what the actual tuples were modified by every transaction. They have to re-execute thing, everything. And this also means they have to re-execute any, uh, any transaction that ended up aborting the first time they ran it because they don't log anything that says that this transaction aborted. They just only log it when it starts, uh, and they just re-execute it just as it was before. So this means that in the case of VoltDB, because you have to re-execute all these transactions over and over again, the amount of time it's going to take to recover the database depends on the amount of time that has elapsed since the last time you took a checkpoint. So let's say you take a checkpoint every hour. That means that you potentially have a one hour's worth of log, a command log, uh, when you recover the database. And so if you're running at 100% utilization, you're running at your max speed of, of what the database could support, it would take you an hour to recover that log. If you say you're only running like, you know, one transaction a minute, then that'll be 60 transactions in your log. So even though it's a, it's a one hour log, you can blast through that in, in milliseconds. So in some ways, it depends on the time that's elapsed. It also depends on like how fast the database system actually can process the, the logs that you have, the, the entries that you have. So I think you could actually store some hints in the, the log to say that, oh, this, by the way, this transaction ended up aborting. Um, and that way, when you, when you came through and replayed it the second time, you could just you know, find these aborted entries and just ignore them as you, as you process. Uh, as you replay the log. But the problem with that is that requires you to do two scans on the log. The first pass to figure out what actually aborted, and the second pass to replay. And I, I think that's a lot of software engineering work for not much, not much gain, right? It's, it'd be an easy optimization, but I, I don't think it's worth it. Okay. So, then we're going to understand the basics of command logging, right? You log the store procedure entry, uh, and that's enough to, to let you to re-execute that same transaction with the same input parameters the second time around. And because our store procedures are ter deterministic, we're guaranteed that the state of the database will be the same no matter how many times you crash and restart and crash and restart. Yes? So, if you're not logging whether it aborted, uh, you, are, you are relying on the fact that it will abort again because it's all deterministic? Yes, correct. Okay, so, the, the thing, like, so a, an abort would be like, uh, you know, someone trying to buy a book that's out of stock. If stock is less, is less than or equal to zero, abort. So like every single time you run, the state of the database is going to be the same, so you're always going to abort. Okay. Uh, the second thing is, on a higher level, command logging is similar to logical logging, right? What's the... Uh, so command logging is, is, is an example of logical logging. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So logical logging doesn't necessarily have to be query only. Right? So it's just the high level information about what you need to do to re-execute whatever it is that you were doing the first time, and no information about where things are actually stored on disk or, or in memory. Yes. But why don't you do it in just one scan? So you can just scan it and see if it's, uh, you just, like, it's like a flag, right? If it has been aborted, you don't do that. So his question is, uh, his question is, why, why if, you, if you provided hints in the command log that a transaction aborted, why would you have to do two scans? Because the issue is that when we log, when, when we write a log out, uh, it's before the transaction starts running. So we don't know whether it's going to abort or not yet. So we would ha then have to do another log that came later that says, this, oh, by the way, you executed transaction one, two, three, maybe you know, a couple milliseconds before. Uh, it's going to abort, so don't actually execute it. So his question is, if... Uh, on that partition, no other transaction is going to, going, going to run until we know our guy aborts. Correct. So, but on a single node, you have multiple partitions, and they're all writing to the same command log. So, it's not like you have to. So, it's not like the. What you could do is you could read ahead a little bit, and have a batch of things, and then. Within that batch, you could recognize, oh, okay, this guy aborts. Yeah, that actually would, would, would work. It's not like you have to scan the entire thing to find that entry, because the, 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 the initial log record for the transaction when it started and then the abort record would be pretty close to each other in the log. And actually, yeah, it actually wouldn't be that bad either, because like, you're not logging that information. So it's not like you would have you know, tens of megabytes 
to, to, to say that a transaction aborted. You just say, yeah, this transaction ID, it aborts. Yeah, so you actually could do this. Actually, I should double check actually whether they do that or not in the real, in the real version. Well, we, we didn't do this in HDOR, but it, I mean, we didn't really care about recovery time. Um, any other questions? Yes? Yeah, so do we rebuild the index on top of the checkpoint, or are we just checkpointing the index? Uh, so the question is, do we rebuild the index uh, based on the checkpoint in the log, or do we actually store the, the index on the checkpoint? And then again, the, 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 as far as I know, for every in-memory database that, that, I, I, that I'm aware of, nobody logs or stores the index on disk. You always rebuild it. It's simply not worth the performance overhead to write out an index durable on the disk, you just rebuild it real quickly on restart. So in the case of OTV, you only store the tuples when you take the checkpoint. You don't store anything about the index. Any other questions? Okay. So let's talk about some things that, that the command logging actually can do that is not as easy to do in physical logging, or I, I, I dare I say even impossible. So Although this course is all about you know, single node databases, I want to talk a little bit about replicated environments. So the basic idea, the way everyone does uh, replication for the most part is you have master-slave replication or primary-secondary. So you have some master node that's going to have the, uh, is where you're going to execute all your writes or take the command or request from the client and be the primary location where you're going to execute it. And then there'll be a replica that you want to have as, much, as tightly as possible be strongly in sync or strongly consistent with the master. And that way, if this guy dies, you can elect this guy to be the new master. And then all the requests go to that. So in, with command logging, again, the client sends the master node our, our procedure name and input parameters. And what we can do is we can just immediately uh, forward this request over to the replica once we assign this transaction, uh, uh, once we assign this request a transaction ID. Right? So we don't even need to wait for this thing to actually start executing on our end. We can immediately just send it over to this other guy. And because we have the transaction ID, we figured out what order we're going to have our transactions uh, run in. And so all the replica needs to do is just look at the transaction ID and makes it, make sure it runs in the right order. Right? And so what's awesome about this is that when the replica finishes executing this transaction, it just needs to send back a single acknowledgment to the master and say, this transaction you told me about before, I executed it and it, it succeeded. It doesn't need to do two-phase commit, like an atomic commit protocol, to make sure that everybody is in sync. So you don't, you don't need to say, hey, did you do that? Yes, I did. OK, let's commit it. OK, I will. Right? It's one, one message back over the wire. And, and we, we can do this because, again, our store procedures are deterministic. So we know that. If these guys have the same database state on both nodes, and our store procedures are guaranteed to, to modify the database in the same way and put it in the same state, then as long as this guy says, I succeeded, then you know that he has the exact same copy of the data that you do. And then you can send back the acknowledgment to the, to, the, to the application. The way you would do this in physical logging is that the, the transaction would run here. And then as it modifies the database, you stream the op log or the physical log to the, uh, to the replica as you go along. Like, I updated this tuple, here's the new value for it, go. Right? And it doesn't actually execute any of the queries, it's just replaying that log for you on, on this other side here. So in that case, you have to do two-phase commit because you have to make sure that everyone got all the same log messages, everyone executed in the same order, and everyone is OK with the, the, applying those changes. Right? So command logging allows you to do what, what is called active-active replication, meaning the transaction is actively running on both all, all the replicas in your cluster uh, versus active passive, where you run the active transaction here, and these guys get the passive updates that are, are generated from, from, the, uh, from the master. So this is sort of clear. So it allows you to avoid two-phase commit, and you can run much faster than you would in a physical logging scheme. So where does command logging fall apart? The problem with command logging is that if you have a transaction that spans multiple nodes or multiple partitions, and one of those partitions goes down, and you don't have a backup, you don't have a replica, you need to restart the entire database system and, and recover every single node. 
Under physical logging, uh, you wouldn't have to do that. You could pause the database. When the node that goes down comes back up, you take the, you know, re recover the checkpoint, replay the log, and get you back up and running. Uh, but you only need to do that for a single node. In command logging, you have to do this for all nodes. So let's look at an example here. Say we have a cluster of three partitions, and just assume that these partitions are running on different nodes. And say we have some pseudocode for a transaction that looks like this. That the first thing we're going to do is execute a query on partition two. We'll get back, get back some value, and then based on that value, we'll execute either partition two or partition three. And let's say that this transaction is running on partition one, and it can make other changes, make, make other modifications. So now, uh, and we send our up, we send our updates to these other these other guys here. So this guy dies, and we're going to take the you know reload the last checkpoint we had and replay our log, and we'd have to replay this exact query or the exact transaction we had before, since it modified these two different uh, partitions here, uh, and we don't know in which way how they did that. We'd have to crash both of these guys and replay them because if we re-executed this these queries where y equals y plus 1, then they may actually be running this again, even though they don't have the same database state that we recover from the checkpoint here. So we can avoid this by having the master-slave replication so that if we have multiple replicas for our partition, it's very unlikely that we're going to have to do a complete restart and uh, recover on every single partition. But if we don't have that, if, if the final master for our partition 1 goes down, then we have to recover everybody. Because they're not all going to have the same state across, across all nodes. Is so that clear why command logging doesn't work? Or command logging, one particular problem with command logging. The other big problem with the, uh, the, the HStore protocol, the concurrential concur scheme, is that it's terrible for analytical queries. Because if, if, if you have a query that spans multiple partitions, you have to hold the locks for those partitions as you run that query, and then you combine all the results to produce the final answer. So that means that uh, while you say your, your transaction or query is running on one partition, it's holding the locks for other partitions, and they're basically sitting idle and doing nothing. So you, the VoltDB stuff is amazing for OLTP. Uh, it does have problems for, for, for very complicated OLAP stuff. And that the, uh, the HANA guys, the Hyper guys, and MemSQL can avoid because they're using MVCC. Okay. All right, so now, uh, in the time that we have left, I want to talk about different ways to do in-memory checkpoints. So we basically talked about two schemes so far. We talked about uh, silo, which is basically doing a scan of and, and tries to avoid writing tuples that it doesn't need in the checkpoint. And then we talked about the vault b case, where you're taking sort of the, you switch into a copy on write mode, or copy on update mode, and you have the snapshot avoid new, new tuples. So I want to talk about four different approaches to do snapshots. Um, and the main thing I'll say is that the choice of approach, or which you actually want to use in your database system, is tightly coupled to what concurrent control scheme you're going to use. Uh, and we'll see in a second, but like for example, if you're using MVCC, then you probably want to use the copy on update mode, or copy on update method, because you already have multiple versions, and you can just you know, skip them as you scan along. Uh, but if you're using two-phase locking or OCC, then you want to use a different approach. So the basic idea of checkpoint is that we just have a separate thread that runs in the background, scans through our table heap, and uh, just you know writes out every tuple that it finds one by one. Um, and if you allow your database system to provide access to the internal threads on the, directly to these table heaps, you don't have to go through the index at all, and you don't have to worry about any locking or latching on those data structures. You can just go through the inv individual tuples. So the four different approaches we're going to talk about are naive snapshots, copy on update snapshots, and then two uh, specialized methods called wait-free zigzag and wait-free ping-pong. Uh, as far as I know, uh, everybody usually implements these guys. I think I don't know if anybody actually implements these in, in, in any of the big systems. But they're worth, at least worth discussing. So naive snapshot is pretty straightforward, pretty easy to understand. You basically just have the database system pause or block all transactions from executing. Then you have your thread take a complete snapshot of the database uh, and write that out to disk. Um, it's super easy to implement. Uh, the problem is, though, obviously you're blocking transactions while you do this. Uh, you can 
you, the way you would block transactions, you basically have your worker thread stop, stop taking new transactions. So that means if you have one transaction that's really, really long, you pause all your other threads or your other worker threads, but that guy keeps on running, and now you're, you have this big blip or time period where you're, you're, you're completely idle. And so the way you usually implement something like this, you have a little timeout that says, I try to pause all my worker threads, but this guy took 10 milliseconds to finish, so therefore I can't do it this time. I'll just re let transactions re-execute again, and maybe that long-running transaction finishes, and I can come back around and do the na try to do the na naive snapshot again. One interesting approach uh, that the hyper geysers proposed, which I actually think is kind of cool, is that instead of having uh, blocking all transactions while you do this, you just fork the database system process, and then you have the child process of the fork be responsible for writing out the checkpoint. So what happens is like you fork the process, and now you have a, a fork process where the same transactions that were active in, in the parent are now active in, in the child. And then you have the child go through and, and abort all those transactions, roll back their changes, and now you have a consistent snapshot of the database that you can then just write out directly to disk and not worry about uh, getting any interleaving from, from active transactions, because all the act new transactions will Fire, get fired off on the on the parent process, not the child. So this is the original idea, one of the original ideas that they proposed in the, the first incarnation of Hyper, which I thought was really kind of cool. We actually tried implementing this in HStore, uh, but it turned out to be a terrible idea because if you fork the, something that runs with a JVM, uh, when the parent process runs garbage collection, that starts reorganizing all the pages. That invokes that calls to the operating system to to copy the pages since it's copy on write. Uh, and then your performance basically completely tanks. Then you also have the problem that when you fork the JVM, it doesn't actually respawn like the garbage collection thread and all the other internal threads. So you have this weird JVM that has a lot of problems. Um, so I think this is this is a good idea, but it only works if you if you're not using Java or Scala. So for the copy on update snapshots, we've already talked about this before. This is what basically VoltDB does. You switch into a special mode, and then instead of doing in-place updates, you always have a tuple copy, or you have a transaction copy, whatever wants to modify to a new location or a shadow copy. And that way, when the checkpoint thread scans through, it just ignores anything that was created after the checkpoint. And you can do this in different granularities. You, VoltDB does it on an individual tuple basis. In other impl implementations, you can do this on a per block basis. OK? So now, the two issues with the naive snapshots and the copy on update snapshots is that uh, the Naive snapshot case has to wait for the checkpoint thread to finish before it's allowed to start executing transactions again. So you have this pause in, in, your, in your throughput. And then in the copy on update case, you may have to acquire latches that are being held by the checkpoint thread to make sure that nobody you know, uh, mucks around with the, the layout of tuples uh, in indexes or other things um, while it's going through the data. So you could have little mini pauses uh, on the copy on update case that you need to avoid. So the way to get around this are two sort of weight-free approaches that they proposed in this paper from the guys at Cornell. Um, and I'll go through real quickly the two, two basic examples. Of what The main idea is that instead of having a single copy of the entire database in memory, they're going to have multiple copies. And they're going to trade off that additional memory overhead to avoid the um, the, 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 wait, the waiting and, the, and the, the locking and latching in the other approaches. So we'll talk about weight-free zigzag first, and then we'll talk about weight-free uh, ping pong. So in weight-free zigzag, what they're going to do is they're going to maintain two bitmaps that keep track of what copy of the database should a transaction modify and what copy of the database should the checkpoint thread read from and write out the disk. And then this allows you to avoid having to copy everything uh, exactly when the transaction modifies stuff, you just assume you have these two copies in the beginning, and you have a little these bitmaps allow you to figure out which which one, which two of the copies you, sh you should look at for every individual tuple. So I'll go through two examples. So here we say we start in the very beginning. We have our two copies of our database in memory, and then we have our two bitmaps that correspond to whether we should be reading and writing what, for what which of these two copies a transaction or checkpoint thread should read and write from. So in this case here, if we're a transaction and we would look in our bitmap for the reads, at this offset zero, that says for the second tuple, we should look at the first copy. And then if we want to modify it, uh, then we want to make sure that we modify the, the second copy. So now, 
our checkpoint thread will start. And in the very beginning, it looks at the right bitmap. And that's going to tell it where it should find the current version of the database at this point in time when the checkpoint starts. So if you look in the right bitmap, it tells you where the right should go. So the, the, the opposite of this is tell you where your read should go. So you just take all of these, this bitmap here, negate everything, and that tells you that you want to look in here to find your consistent snapshot. So now, uh, when our transactions start running, while the checkpoint occurs, we look in our right bitmap, to, and then for each slot or each tuple position, that tells us that we should be modifying their values over here. And for our reads, we look over there, and we have to update. We update this bitmap when we mod after we modified the values that tell us that we want to read. If a transaction wants to read from the database of this tuple again, this is the copy you should look at. So we sort of have to keep these two guys in sync, or this thing and this thing. So now, when the checkpoint finishes, uh, we we have a we were able to write this complete copy out, and that's consistent on disk. So when we start the next checkpoint. We'll do the same thing where we, uh, where we flip the, the, the right bitmap to say all the writes now go to the first copy. And then we negate everything here that tells us we have now our zigzagged, uh, the, 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 the consistent view of the, the, the database zigzags across these two different copies here. right? Because we negate where we wrote to, and that tells us where we should read from. And then the same thing now if we have our transaction actually uh, read and write anything, we'd always look in our write bitmap to tell us where we need to go. So in this case here, if we want to modify the first tuple, we want to modify it in the first copy. If you, and if we want to modify the second tuple, we modify it in the second copy. So this clear? So this is basically, we have two copies of the database, and we use these bitmaps to say where the checkpoint thread should be looking at and where the transaction should be reading and writing. OK. So in wait-free ping pong, we're now going to bring back a third copy of the database. Uh, and then we're going to have this be uh, sort of a master version that we can do all our current writes. And then the shadow copy would be where the, the checkpoint thread can read a consistent snapshot of the database and write that out. And the idea here is that we can do all our updates in the, in the master version, and that doesn't interfere with the, the current state of the, of the snapshot in the shadow copy. So the problem with this approach, as we'll see in a second, is that unlike before under weight-free ping pong, is that under oh, sorry under weight-free zigzag for every single write we we have to do in our transaction, we only have to update one location in the database. In weight-free ping pong, every single write has to update two locations on the two different copies. So if we go here, so we have now our master pointer that says copy two is where all our new updates should go. We have our complete original copy of the current state of the database. And then copy three is considered the shadow. And this is where all our checkpoints will go. So our checkpoint thread starts here. It has a consistent, consistent snapshot of the database and just scans through it and writes all these, these tuples out one by one. But then our transactions show up here. And every time, time we do a write, we're going to update the, the, sort of the complete copy of the database, but then also update our, our master copy here. And then we flip a bit to say that this thing has been modified since we started our, our new checkpoint. Now the checkpoint thread finishes, uh, and we want to we want to switch. So this thing's going to become the new master, and this guy's going to become the shadow. And our checkpoint thread is going to want to read through this and write that as the checkpoint out. So what we have to do is we flip all the the, the bits here to zero to say that we've been modified since the last time we started, and then we can zero out also all the memory locations as well. So we don't, we don't see dirty data when we come back the second time. So now we flip our pointer, uh, the master pointer, to say that the copy number three is our current master. And then this is where the checkpoint thread is going to look. But the problem is that we don't have a complete view of the database here because we didn't modify all the tuples. right? So some of these spots here are still empty. So what we have to do is either go out and copy the exact, um, all, the whole, all the things we're missing from the current copy, the complete copy of the database, into our uh, shadow copy that we're running at the checkpoint. Or we have to go on disk and find the last checkpoint that we took and fill in these holes here. So then we can then just scan through its entirety and write that out as a consistent snapshot. So this allows us to avoid the uh, overhead of doing locks and sort of doing all these bit flips all the time. 
Um, but we had to do this extra work to go fetching things from disk to fill, fill in the gaps. And this is why I don't think anybody actually does this. All right, so the different uh, ways we, we implement all these things, uh, we're doing bulk state copying, locking, bulk bitmap reset, and, and paying a big penalty for memory usage. So all of these are different sort of design decisions you have to make about what, what your checkpoint method actually does. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these, but like the basic idea is that you, uh, the, the weight-free ping pong and the weight-free zigzag pay additional penalty for having higher memory usage by avoiding the, the, some of the bottlenecks you can have in, in the, sort of the naive case or the copy and update case. And then there's this table here that shows you uh, what the different methods, for each different method, what the, which one of these design decisions or, or, or trade-offs they have to make. And as you can see in the case of wait for your ping pong, you have to have three copies of the database, which I think is not a good trade-off. Okay? So this is, I went through this very quickly. I just want to show you that there's different ways to implement your, your checkpoint method in the system other than just the silo way and the, uh, and the, the VoltDB way. Okay. So uh, up until now, we've been mostly talking about checkpoints, logging, recovery, and all these things, uh, assuming that the database has crashed in, in a bad way, right? But not all database restarts where you have to recover from a log and a checkpoint are due to like sort of hard crashes, right? So it could be the case that you want to update like the, the OS kernel or the libraries. You want to upgrade the hardware. Um, or maybe you just want to update the actual database software itself. So in the first two cases here, this is probably going to require you to restart the database system, right? Or restart the node that where the database system is running. So in that case, yes, you're going to have to shut down the system and then load back up from the last checkpoint and, and replay the log to get you back to a correct state. This last one here, updating the system software, that doesn't require a shutdown and restart of the operating system. That just requires a shutdown and restart of the database system itself. So ideally, it would be nice if we could not have to go through the huge penalty of, of you know, replaying our logs uh, and reading things back from disk when we want to upgrade our database system software. So this is sort of the motivation behind the, the Facebook method for doing fast restarts by using shared memory. Uh, so they're, they're focusing on the third problem here. And so they're, they're doing this in a system called SCUBA. Uh, it's not a publicly released system, but it's an internal database system that was developed at Facebook to allow them to do really fast uh, uh, event detection and anomaly analysis on log data that's generated by all their different services. So the basic way to think about this is say you have like, uh, you know, for the timeline, there's all these different services it's going get, to get invoked in order to generate the HTML that's passed off to the, to the user browser. And so what they want to be able to do is they want to be able to look at cases where the timeline generation took a long time, look at all the different services in their, in their stack and figure out which one of them was causing, a, you know, causing things to run slowly. And so all of their different, uh, their, all, all the different software is all generating these log events about how long it took for every individual request and then you want to throw that into a database and you want to run, again, your analytical queries to, figure, to identify where you have problems. So Scuba is a system that's designed to do this. So it's not doing transactions. It's not doing stuff that sort of directly faces the user. It's all internal backend stuff. So they have a nice little, uh, they can relax some of the protections that a database system knows to provide because they don't care so much that the queries that execute on Scuba are 100% accurate. So that means that if some log events get dropped, you know, they have, you know, millions and millions of people using their, their stuff all the time. If you lose, you know, a couple events a day, uh, you hit the, in the back. You, you, your head's hitting it, yes. So if you have, if you have a bunch of different events, uh, if they sort of get lost, it's, it's not a big deal. So Scuba is sort of a system to do this kind of log analysis. It's not doing, you know, not guaranteeing all the protections that, like, MySQL would. So they have actually an interesting architecture. It's a he heterogeneous setup where you're going to have some nodes in the system are called leaf nodes, and that's where they actually store the data in an in, in-memory in database with a you know, on-disk log. And then there's these aggregator nodes that sort of sit above it in the hierarchy that are responsible for sending down query requests to the leaf nodes 
and then they come back with results and they combine them together and then push them up further up, up in a tree. And this is actually the same architecture that the MemSQL guys use. So it sort of looks, looks like this. So you have these leaf nodes at the bottom. This is where the actual database is, and there's a log that they, they keep, you know, they, they maintain for all the new events that are coming in. So as every time you, know, you, you click on something in Facebook, it generates a bunch of log events that goes through Scribe, which is their version of Kafka, like a message broker system. And then those messages arrive in the leaf nodes and they get, then get stored in the database. So now if you as like an internal developer at Facebook execute a query, it would first land on the, the root of the aggregator uh, tree, and then it percolates down where you actually do the scans and filters of these lowers guys, and then it gets combined on the way back up. It's sort of like you think of it as a, a MapReduce model, but doing uh, SQL queries to do group buys and aggregations. So what we're talking about to do fast restarts is we're talking about doing it on the leaf nodes here because this is actually where the data is. These aggregate nodes are, are stateless. You don't maintain any information about what's in, the, what's in the database. It just knows how to take results and combine them together. So these guys are CPU bound and these guys are uh, disk and memory bound. Okay, so at Facebook, they have this, uh, this uh, sort of coding... Um, practice or edict or philosophy that they want to push out updates all the time. I think their turnaround time is like every two weeks or four weeks or something. So they're making changes to their products, they're making changes to their systems all the time, and they're pushing those changes and deploying them on a really sh short time interval. So rather than in like years for every update, they're doing things in weeks. So the problem is if you try to restart a database every two weeks, uh, and you have to restart from disk, it's going to be really slow to do a mass upgrade across all your nodes if you have a really large cluster. So what they want to be able to do is that they want to be able to have the database system store the, its current contents of memory in shared memory and then restart, come back up, look in shared memory and put it back into its heap. So, because you're allowing the, the contents of memory to, to outlive the lifetime of the, of the process, and you want your new process to be able to reuse the old memory and not have to scan everything from disk again, because that could take hours. Whereas in this case, you can restart in now seconds. And that matters a lot if they're making changes all the time, because the amount of time that any node in your cluster is down is, is, is reduced significantly. And again, they don't care so much about having a 100% accurate queries because they're okay with losing log events, but still you don't want your, your nodes to be churning and, and taking a long time to recover. So there's two different ways to do the shared memory restart. The first approach is that you can rewrite your memory allocator to use shared memory. Right? Instead of calling you know, you know, libc malloc, you can actually have your own version of malloc that knows how to allocate and divide things up into shared memory. And then when you come back around, when, when your process restarts, you just, your allocator knows to go, how to go find the things that it left around the, the first time. Um, it's really fascinating when you read in the paper is, uh, they actually, I think Facebook uh, employs the guy who wrote the JE malloc, which is a faster version of malloc, and they spent a lot of time talking with like the guy who wrote a faster version of malloc about whether this would actually work, and in the end, that guy convinced them that no, you don't want to do this because it'd be a huge pain in the ass to use shared memory for malloc if you have to sub subdivide things up in to different segments, it'd be bad for performance, and it's very tricky to make, maintain thread safety uh, across your different, uh, if you have multiple uh, processes all allocating to shared memory regions, um, how do you make sure that they don't kill each other? Another problem with using shared memory heaps is that unlike in regular malloc, when you, when you, you know, allocate a chunk of memory that's not physically backed in, in physical memory yet, right, they wait until you actually try to do something and get a page fault before they allocate things. In shared memory, when you call malloc in shared memory, it allocates it right away. And so that would be slower and more problematic for, for, for what they wanted. So what they pro proposed to do is when the database system was going to restart, they just copy whatever's ever in their heap out into shared memory, restart the process, and then copy it back into shared memory back into the heap. Right? It makes it easier because you, you, you avoid this, this sort of runtime overhead. Uh, and you have to add some extra stuff to make sure everything's safe and, and, and doesn't have any problems when you restart, um, but it's not that much more work. So that's essentially what they're doing in Facebook with these scuba restarts. The idea is that when the administrator says, I want to do a restart, it, takes an, it makes an in-memory checkpoint 
of the, of the database, writes it out to shared memory, and, and then when it completes, it writes a little log message to say, I took a checkpoint and I know I completed everything. So that way, like, if you, if you recover the database, if you, if, you, if you restart and come back, you don't try to pull in contents of shared memory that is incomplete because your, your, process, your process crashed before you completed the copy. Um, they also have some checks to make sure that like, if you modify the version of the, the shared memory layout from one process version or software version to the next, you don't kind of come back and read, read it back in and get corrupted data. Right? So they have a bunch of uh, mechanisms in place to make sure that these restarts are seamless and they're fail safe. And then if you ever try to restart and realize that your shared memory is corrupted or your shared memory is not what you expect there to be, then you just restart from the way it was uh, off of a disk, as you normally would, because right? that's always guaranteed to be durable for you. So again, they're not doing this for checkpoints as the way we would do this for, for recovery. You're just doing this so you can restart the database system itself uh, and reuse what was already mal uh, allocated in memory. In the back, yes? No, this is on a single machine. This has nothing to do with any. This is a single node. I'm restarting. Uh, I copy everything to, to shared memory. I restart the process, and I just copy it back in. <laughs> correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So this is not like this is not a crash. This is like, oh, I have a new version of my database system. I want to push it out right away. Uh, let me issue the shutdown request. It writes everything out to shared memory. You restart. Uh, with a new version of the software and you copy everything back in. It's not for recovery at all. It just avoids having to read everything back from disk. That's a good point though. Okay. Any questions about this? So this is not really like, I think it's a clever idea. It was a neat little paper. Uh, it's you know, not something that, um, it is, uh, how do I say this? It's, you know, this doesn't guarantee your database is durable. This just makes it easier to, to cycle things through. Okay. Okay, so what are my parting thoughts? Uh, logical logging is obviously faster than physical logging at runtime, but as we saw that there's certain corner cases and scenarios where it can make recovery more problematic. And if your environment, if, if your application is, is, if you have enough hardware to, to replicate things as much as possible, uh, then maybe that's okay and you don't, you don't pay that huge penalty because you always have a backup node. Um, it's my opinion that the copy on, on update checkpoint method is probably the best way to go if you're using a uh, multi-version concurrent control. I don't know if anybody's using the, the wait-free ping pong or zigzag stuff um, because I don't think most places would be comfortable you know, having your database double or triple in size just to take, just to take faster checkpoints. And then as we saw it in the Facebook restart case, uh, shared memory actually has some use, use after all. Uh, and I think that's a neat little trick, and actually that's something I think would be cool to add in our system. Okay, so just as a quick checkpoint of where we are in the course. So we have gone through all these topics here. So the, again, this is what I would say, that these are the core fundamental principles of database system implementation that you need to have if you're ever building a new database system. So sort of right before spring break, this is what we've gotten so far. So now for the rest of the semester, we're going to talk about these topics here. These are sort of like the added bonuses, the, the extra stuff or the more mo things you would have in a modern system to help you get better performance. So that's sort of what our focus is going to be on for the rest of the semester going forward are all these additional things that not every system out there is going to have, whereas most systems out there have these. But these are the kind of things, if you want to build a new system that can take advantage of new hardware, new problems, and new applications, and things like that, these are this kind of stuff that we're going to focus on uh, for the rest of the semester. And I would say these are the kind of stuff that you could probably consider in, for your project. Be, be project three, that would be kind of cool. OK, so as a reminder, project two is not due this Wednesday. It's due the Wednesday during spring break on, on March 9th at 12 PM. Your, everyone's proposal for project number three is still going to be due on the Monday we come after spring break on March 14th. Right? Everyone's going to have to come up here and present for five minutes what exactly they're going to work on. Okay? Uh, and there's no reading required for this, for this Wednesday's class because I'll spend time talking about topics for Project 3. Right? So I'll come up and propose 12, 15 different things that you could work on, and then you guys go out and figure out like, what, what do you actually want to do. And then also talk about the, the extra credit that we're going to have on the course. The website is not up yet. Uh, but we, I want to talk about it and discuss it, and that way people, people can get started on it. 
Okay? Any questions? All right. Have a good, uh, don't use the bathroom on the ninth floor because uh, there's no water. But other than that, have a good day.